Chris Broussard, FS1 NBA analyst. I, you know, I was saying this earlier. So if you and I had a conversation, I had a conversation with you, and uh, it was uh, like in the back here where we would grab apples and fruit and stuff. And then the next day it was in the paper. I'd be like, dog, <laughs> that ain't cool. That ain't good. Like, I'm reading all this stuff about this team meeting. I'd be ticked off if I was Kevin Love and Isaiah Thomas. Who's leaking it? Like, the, to me, you don't do that in a brotherhood. You don't ha you don't bury your team. I would never go to a media critic and bury one of my coworkers. Like, I can't believe that stuff gets out. Kevin Love's a man. He's standing up there answering all these questions. And, and I'm sitting there thinking, if I was Kevin Love, I would say, but my biggest issue is, how the hell do you know what happened? <laughs> Who's leaking this stuff? I'm, I'm with you totally. Um, obviously, as a media member, you like those leaks. Sure. But, yeah, as a player on that team, somebody in that organization, it, it, it may have been somebody in the front office. Really? I, I'm not sure it was a player. I don't know, but I, I would – if I had to guess, I would think more front office than a player. Uh, however, uh, either way, it's ridiculous. And I think what what now that we do know at least some things about the meeting, to target Kevin Love. Again. All the problems that this team has, <laughs> you just gave up 148 <laughs> points and at didn't, home. And he didn't play he that didn't game. He didn't play. It might have been 168 <laughs> if he had played. Like, why are you jumping on Kevin Love? That's ludicrous. And then, if it's true, as the report said, Isaiah Thomas led the charge, that is even more ridiculous. And I got to be honest, if, if Isaiah Thomas did indeed go after Kevin Love yeah. for missing a game because he was sick, and LeBron James, Dwayne Wade, Tristan Thompson, some a, a leader... Or a guy that's been there with Kevin Love, a guy you've gone to battle with for three and a half years, a guy that helped you win the finals, a guy that was playing terrifically before Isaiah Thomas got back. If none of them stepped up and to Isaiah, like, look, man, no, that's out of line, you know, then that's a problem. One of them should have stepped. Not that Love can't defend himself, but as the leaders of your team, you can't let somebody step in after playing eight you know games. You know what's funny? You know, this is, we said this yesterday. And say that about a veteran. Kevin Love's become Chris Bosh. Chris Bosh is one of the best dudes in the NBA. One of the smartest guys, best dudes. At the end of the run with LeBron, he'd been marginalized to a finesse three. <laughs> we were like, he can't stay healthy. He Both Kevin Love and Bosh gave up 25-point-a-game careers to be LeBron's valet. Not even the second score, the third score. Kevin Love has a right to be a little agitated. Yep. I go from a 25-12 guy to now Isaiah Thomas is calling me out <laughs> in meetings. Like, can we, three years ago, we wanted to, two years ago, everybody in the world wanted to trade Kevin Love, and I remember saying, time out. He's a pretty good player. He had 14 rebounds in that game seven. 14. He was crucial. Kevin Love has given them roughly 18 points and 10 rebounds a game for the last three seasons as the definitive third option. That is hard to do. You won't find another third option in the league, definitive one, that gave you those types of numbers. And remember, we talked about it. I was like, when Isaiah gets back, if he becomes the second option, and I think he thinks he's 1A, you know, that could be a problem. Yes. Because one of the reasons Love was excelling, it wasn't just to move the center. It was that now I know I'm the second guy. By the way. And Love, he should be. Oh, he should be. Listen, Love's not playing well when Isaiah's on the court. Isaiah's not playing well when Kevin Love's on the court. If I had to trade one or the other, I'd trade Isaiah. No question. I'd trade Isaiah before Kevin Love. I like this George Hill deal if they, if they can get it done. And I'm not saying George Hill is great. And I think initially if they bring him in, he's a very good defender. He shoots 45% from three. If you I, – I think their plan will be Isaiah at the one, George Hill at the two. But as time goes on, if Isaiah's chemistry, if it doesn't improve with the team and he's not playing better and defensively is still terrible, I would move – this is where Tyler has to make the tough decisions. But I would have George Hill as my starting point guard – and put Isaiah on the bench. Woo! It wouldn't make him happy. Woo! And I, you know what? And I'm going I'm to defend Isaiah on this. I get why it wouldn't make him happy. This is his one shot. His one shot to get paid. He's never, he made $6 million last year and this year as the fifth 
MVP, like, you know, fifth in the voting for MVP last year. This is his first and only chance to get close to a max deal. So he wants to shine, and I get it. It's uh, a yeah. business. Yeah, but, it's, but it's, it's not your team. It's LeBron's. No, it's not. And so it, he, it's, a tough, it's a tough situation in Cleveland. So, so there's a, Nick Wright brought this up earlier. And, and, I, and I'm trying to, like, I like to figure out kind of the big picture why stuff happens. Not just what happened. We know Kevin Durant got thrown out again. But, like, why is stuff happening? And there is this sense that, you know, socially, you know, the Warriors are smarter than everybody. They're early adapters. The owner's like, we're so far ahead of everybody. And as they're all rich now, that referees are insignificant and downright tedious. Maybe that's it. Explain to me how Kevin Durant has become in the last month a cross between Rashid Wallace and Dennis Rodman. <laughs> He's getting thrown out regularly. What is going on with Kevin Durant? Yeah, and look, I'm very fond of Kevin Durant. I supported him when he made his move to Golden State. I've talked to him off the, away from the game about spirituality He's off and the all rails, types of right stuff. stuff. But yeah, right. He's, it's almost like he's, to me, like losing himself to yes. some degree. And when you are a guy who was quiet, nice, and, you know, a, a, a different personality in Oklahoma when you were the man, and then all of a sudden you get around the best team and the guys who are the big kids on the block, and now you want to start talking trash and, you know, you're coming out and, and you're just acting totally differently. That's not a good look. That's not If you can't stand up and be this way when you're the man, don't stand up and be that way when your boys are behind you. That's really you know interesting. What I mean? That's what it looks like, whether that's – how he's, he's feeling, like a, that's what it looks like. He's the guy that goes to the bar, and because he's got his two toughest friends with him, now he's the tough guy at the bar. Yes. Now he's chatty guy. Yeah. And by the way, he was quiet, silent guy in Oklahoma that's, City. That's what I'm saying. Be who you are. And I didn't like the other day when he called out Clint Capella. Yeah, like, come on, dude. He th th That is, there's no reason. I just find it very interesting that Kevin Durant, I covered Rasheed Wallace. He's Rasheed now. Like, he's going off the rails like, once a week, yeah, like you're that, like, that, dude. Last night he got ejected with what? Two, was there two minutes left? They were up 17. Like the game is over. Why are you concerned that you didn't get a little call on a drive to the basket? So the Celtics. Uh, I told Christine earlier. I, I don't losing streaks. You travel to the other coast. Boston's lost four straight. I don't make much of it. You know. I, and I said this. This sounds goofy, but sometimes teams get sick. Two guys get sick. Oh yeah. You go on the road. They're it, not sick. I'm just throwing uh, th things like this in the NBA. Yeah. I don't make much of sh – they're a well-coached team, and they'll get to the playoffs and host a bunch of series. I do notice this, though. Jason Tatum's hit a wall, and he's a big deal for them. He's a 19-year-old. In January now, he's shooting 33%. Yep, yep. And I'm like, no, no, no that's something. Because, by the way, you need him to be big to beat. You don't have Jay Crowder. You don't have Avery Bradley. Like, you got two scorers now. And you're going to need Jason Tatum to be double figures and play some defense in the postseason. Are you worried all about a four-game losing streak and Jason Tatum statistically kind of deteriorating? Like you said, the losing streak isn't a big deal, but Tatum's hit the wall. Not only him, Jalen Brown, 41% in January. Oh, his, his shooting is way down as well. And they're two young guys. Jalen Brown wasn't used to playing these types of minutes last year. Ah, so good let's point. watch it. But if those two hit a wall, which is understandable, almost predictable, this is an entirely different team. They can't score. They're not a big-time scoring they're team. Not. Defensively, that's why they're great. But offensively, they can't score. And back to Cleveland, this is why if you're the Cavs, and let's see, because you and I are kind of similar in this thinking that LeBron may be sending a message, and the players, because of him, a message to ownership. I believe he is. That, yeah, get, get something, something done. done. After the trade deadline, I want to see how the Cavs and LeBron play. The energy, that's the body told, language. That's what I've been saying. Yeah, if if because here's the thing, they have to realize nobody is going to kill you if you get swept by Golden State. You might give up 148 <laughs> points every game. Nobody's going to kill you. They will kill you if you lose to Boston or Toronto or Washington or somebody like yeah. that. I told Christine this is a weird thing that I've never discussed on the air. But January, we've had multiple team meetings in the NBA in the last two weeks. Mm -hmm. And I said, January's a weird time to be a pro athlete in the NBA. Your name's in the paper. Hey, honey, I'm being traded. We have to get our kids out of school and move. 
yeah, it screws locker rooms up. If literally tomorrow you read in the paper, we're trading you to NBC, you'd be like, uh, honey, we, we got to move our family. So You're very you, right. You're so very in right. January, players are reading they're going to be swapped. And a lot of guys are like, I thought my team loved me. Well, time out. You're trading me for that guy? So, like, I think January is a rough month psychologically for locker rooms. I, I agree with you wholeheartedly. Your average fan and person doesn't re realize how tough this is on players. I mean, again, you, you just said it. Put yourself in anybody else's sh in their shoes. If you had, if you were walking around the halls and you saw your supervisors and you read that they were trying to get rid of you to bring in somebody else to do your job. It that would, would bother you. I would go it home creates, that it day. Would strain, it would create yeah. stress all through my family. My kids would read about it. My wife would talk about it. My wife would complain to me. So You I, would be different here absolutely. with the way you respond to I wouldn't people, be so, as yeah. brilliant as I usually <laughs> am. Thanks for watching. Subscribe here to get the latest from the show. Also, be sure to check out more of the best clips from The Herd or go watch a few segments from our other shows on FS1.